Well, welcome to Ditch Digger CEO today, David. We're happy to have you. We've got uh, Robbie on the line with me, and we're going we're gonna to pepper you with questions and listen to your story and have a lot of fun with you today, if that's okay with you. Sounds great. Good to be here. Good to be here, Gary. Thanks for joining, so, David. Yeah, so, so, da so David, uh, you know what? We, uh, we, I, I just know your, your story, and, and I, and I want to get to know you in person someday because you seem like you got a heart of gold, and that's, that's, I surround myself with friends that, that do. Um, and, and your, your story, your business, everything is around, um, you know, culture and, and values and, and, uh, you know, and, and fun. Right. So okay, uh, I guess we want to, we want to really hear about your, your upbringing and where, where it all came from. So if you can hear about that, I'd love to get into everything else after that, but tell, tell us about, uh, where this all started, man, where, where, where the, where the story of David Hassel started. Yeah, that's great. So I was, uh, I was born in Manhattan and, uh, mid late seventies. And, uh, my, uh, my parents had worked for companies their entire careers. In fact, uh, my dad started, my dad was a, was a musician, uh, in, from England and he ended up on a cruise liner as the cruise director. Uh, oh, my mom wow. met him on the cruise ship, uh, from Union City, New Jersey. Oh. And uh, he eventually moved to New York. My grandfather had been a jeweler. So, uh, my dad was really, his heart was in music, wanted to get a job at Sony music on fifth Avenue in New York. Uh, they didn't have any openings at that time, so we walked down the street to Tiffany and Company and uh, got a job selling watches, thinking he'd be there temporarily. Uh, he had some background in that. And that was 1972. Uh, he's still at Tiffany and Company today, uh, almost 50 years later. Uh, retired at 65, but then kept working 40 hours a week. Uh, around that same time, my mom started as, as a nurse at NYU Medical Center. Uh, all also retired at the same time and is also still a nurse at NYU Medical Center nearly 50 years later. So wow. very different track my parents had. Uh, neither went to, uh, to, to university. My mom obviously went to nursing school. Um, and, you know, there were really wonderful things about that path, uh, you know, creating, you know, a, a really beautiful, great family upbringing and, and home and a lot of stability. Um, but there were also things about working for, a, for another company and not having that sense of direction and control that I think, you know, I think a lot of times kids will, will uh, rebel in some way and kind of choose a different path than their parents. And I think entrepreneurship was that for me. Um, cool. And seeing all the things I didn't want, uh, but also being, you know, them instilling great values and, and supporting me growing up and, and, and seeding the idea of, of what could be possible. I remember my mom gave me a cutout from the New York Times once that said, uh, even, even a great idea is only an idea until you make it real. And there was just something about that that triggered something in me. I put that up on my mirror in my bedroom. Uh, I just had this idea, that this, this concept that I could go out and actually uh, uh, create things uh, as opposed to just following the rules. Uh, so I had that for my age. Now, uh, how, about how old, how old were you when, you, when, you, when you did that, when you pinned that up on your mirror in your bedroom and thought about that? I think that was probably 13 or 14, 12, somewhere between 12 and 14, around there. And, uh, you know, the first thing, I, when I went off to, to high school, I went to this, uh, I chose to go to a high school that you know, required me commuting on a train for an hour and a subway for 20 minutes down in Jersey City, New Jersey. So I had a lot of freedom at an early age. And uh, I remember uh, pretty much the first week of school, we were in this band room uh, in the basement. And as we, you know, when I had music classes, and as I walked out, I noticed there were these light bulbs up in this ante room. Uh, this red light bulb and a green light bulb, and there were windows into these two rooms. And I, I was like, huh, I wonder, you know, what was this space? And I come to find it used to be a television studio, where oh. they, uh, they used to broadcast to the, to the, uh, to the local community uh, on cable news. And uh, the one little tiny, what used to be the control room, had all this old, amazing NBC camera equipment in there. Uh, and so I found, once I found that out, it was using used as a junk room. I petitioned the school to get some, some funds to, uh, to actually kind of bring it back alive. They gave me some space. And, you know, by my senior year, we were producing a late live daily show, kind of like a tonight yeah. show style thing where, you know, we had the, I got the funniest kid in school to sit behind the desk and we, you know, bring down teachers and interview them. Uh, and, uh, and that was just a really fun thing to create something like that. Yeah. Uh, sadly, awesome. it fell apart when I left, and that was one of my big learnings is that, you know, if you're going to create something, you can't, it can't just be all about you. You've got to create the systems and processes and bring other people in to own something if you want it to have continuity. Yeah. 
Cool. That's that's a great lesson you learned there. No doubt about it. Yeah. That's such a that that would be so much fun. And and think all the memories other kids could have if they could have they, they, that could have been sustainable, exactly. right? Thankfully, someone else did about ten years ten years later bring it back to life. Right. So so it is a thriving thing now. Awesome. And uh, okay, so, so you, uh, high school and went you went you went you go to college, go to university or no? I did. I went to Tufts. I studied computer engineering um, at that that time I was really interested in I think I was interested in just this idea of could we use technology to improve medicine actually I was I was curious about biomedical engineering but this was the uh, mid mid 90s uh, computers were just starting to kind of come to the fore at least in the in the form of being networked and so I went off to Tufts and I studied computer engineering and got really into software and and, and the internet uh, and so when I, when I graduated, uh, I, I had this bug that I wanted to start something and be, be an entrepreneur. That was clearly in me. Uh, there were entrepreneurial things I did in college. Um, but when I, when I graduated, I still didn't, I didn't have an idea. And I actually honestly didn't feel like I had the confidence to go out and start something. So I went to work for a big consulting company. Uh, and I, I, I ended up, um, working in a, what I call beige cubicle land in a window, windowless computer office in Roseland, New Jersey, building insurance technology and uh, uh, working from 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. at night and just remember saying to myself, like, I can't, I can't believe this is my life. I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> um, and so, you know, uh, I was a high performer. They gave me two raises in six months, almost doubled my salary. And I said, look, I, I just, I need to do something different. Send me on a client. They sent me out to Denver, Colorado. And that was fun. I'm 23 years old. I'm flying out to Denver every Monday, back every Thursday. Uh, eventually convinced them to give me a corporate apartment instead of uh, paying the Marriott. So I could go ski every weekend and fly my friends out with the plane ticket. There we go. Yeah. So you know, I did a lot of that, um, and uh, really, you know, kind of fell in love with skiing, which is still a big part of my uh, my outdoor life. Um, but uh, but during that time, I met somebody uh, who was a really had a really good business mind. He was a consultant at the same company, and this was in 1999, just as the dot com was 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 really getting close to its peak. Yep. And so we left in the summer to fall of 1999 and started an ad tech company in New York City. Uh, just before everything kind of uh, fell apart. Uh, we raised about $800,000, um, moved into an office, made a lot of mistakes, uh, but, but I learned a lot about uh, running a business and navigating a major downturn as well during that time. Yeah. Wow. What, what did that company do? It was advertising technology. So uh, I was looking at the market around this time when I was working for the consulting company, looking at companies like DoubleClick, who had gotten into this market, if you remember at the time, online advertising was essentially banner ads. And yep. when they first put banner ads up there, we still had this idea, some people even talk about it today, of surfing the web. And what, what it meant to surf the web was you didn't have a purpose. You'd go on a website, it was this novel thing, where there was this information, and you'd click a link and go somewhere else. And then you'd click another link and you'd go somewhere else. And that was the idea of surfing. Yes. Um, and so banner ads came out. And people were like, oh my God, here's a cool another thing for me to click. So when they first introduced that, the, the click rates relative to the impressions were very, very high. And so they were able to sell these impressions at a very high cost per thousand CPM. And, uh, and then over a period of 18 months, I watched the click rates plummet by about 90%. So these companies, wow. you know, losing like, oh my gosh, this industry is collapsing. Why is this happening? Well, it turned out, People have grown more task-oriented on the web. That was my, my, my assessment of the situation. Like, you want to go read the news. You want to go read your email. You want to check the stock site. You don't want to click something and go buy something in the middle of right. what you're doing. It's more purpose-oriented. So we came up with a theory like, you know, could we actually interact with somebody in an ad without them leaving what they're doing and then communicate with them to a sale later? And so we started uh, delivering coupons to these ad placement holders, uh -huh. um, which, you know, at the time, it was a really neat, fun idea, and it, and it worked, um, but, you know, six or seven years into that process, uh, while I'd learned a lot about running a business, and I learned a lot about my strengths, I also learned that I can't, I didn't really like doing something that I wasn't very passionate about, ultimately helping people sell uh, things they probably didn't need 
to sell or people didn't need to buy necessarily. There were, you know, a lot of people, a lot, 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 lot of people looking to use the internet to, you know, just sell more stuff. And I thought it's interesting. It's, you know, it's an interesting technological problem to solve, but it didn't feel like connected to a sense of fulfillment or purpose for myself. Okay. In coming, David, from a, a background of the computer engineering and focusing and more on the software side of the house, you mentioned that you had someone who was more business-minded. Yes. I'd be curious, uh, from your perspective, what sort of takeaways or skills that the business-minded individual uh, has the ability to learn from software without ever being a full software engineer or, or programmer, uh, and how that applies to growing the business like the way you guys have and will continue to. That's a great question. You know, in that case, my, my partner at that time didn't have a technical background. And I think it actually caused, uh, there were areas where it caused some friction. Um, because I don't think, it's hard to have empathy and understanding for something that you have no context for. Uh, now I'm in a position where I've been the CEO of 15.5 for nine years. And, but I, ha and I haven't actually seen a line of our code, which is, I pride myself on that. I have a, a chief technology officer and a, you know, 70 person engineering team who builds all that stuff out. Um, but, but I can, I understand the technology and I can relate with people who are doing that kind of work. Um, whereas I think in my, in my, in the ad tech company, you know, there was some friction and conflict, uh, because in that case, you know, my partner was always wondering why we couldn't just go faster or why it didn't work certain ways. Um, and I, th I think so it's, it's useful to have that, that background and understanding. And would you say that focusing on the product management, would that be a good takeaway for someone who's more business minded to better understand how that process works or? I think it's, uh, it's finding, ultimately finding someone you can partner with and who you can fully trust. Okay. Right. And so finding somebody who has that deep level of expertise uh, like in my case, I have a, a, my CTO who I actually hired in 2003 while I was building this ad tech company. We worked together for three years. He was the, one of the first engineers I hired, and then you know, he was responsible for a whole product. Uh, and then when, when it came time to start 15.5, you know, we had that relationship, and I, I trusted the way that he worked and his commitment and his technical acumen. Uh, and so I think that that's, you know, yeah, I think that, that that's probably one of the things I would advise. Awesome. So from there, from that business, then uh, David, what, you know, what, what, you know that that shut down. Then it was a sold. What happened there? No, it's actually still going today. Uh, my my original partner's still running it. Um, we did execute a buyout, so I, I ended up with an earnout from that business and and uh, moved out to the Bay Area. Uh, at that time, I also started with uh, with a couple of friends an adventure travel company in Brazil. I found myself uh, really interested in kite surfing. Uh, um, and I was pretty burned out from the ad tech business. So I thought, you know, I, I had this idea that this whole kite surfing thing back in 2004, 2005 was going to become a big thing. Nobody knew what it was. In fact, uh, the gentleman who told me about it, I was living with a couple of Brazilians in Manhattan at the time. And there was this mysterious, tall, dark Brazilian guy named Alberto who would fly into New York in the summers, uh, make a bunch of money working at the Boathouse restaurant in New York City, and then fly back to Brazil uh, and be able to live the rest of the year on the beach kite surfing uh, because the exchange rate was so good at that time. Yeah. And, and Alberto kept talking about kite surfing and kite surfing. And in my mind, in my mind, cause he's got this thick accent, I'm thinking he means windsurfing cause I don't, you know, I, he's just using this funny terminology. So one day he actually shows up at my apartment with all this kite surfing gear. I realized it's not what I thought it was. He shows me videos and I said, you have to teach me that right now. <laughs> and so I learned how to kite surf on the beaches of Long Island in 2004. So I think this is going to be huge. We should start a business. And we started running adventure tours in Brazil in 2005 before the whole world discovered this was one of the premier locations. Uh, and we do these 10-day downwind adventure tours using dune buggies and land rovers where, you know, you drive on the beach and have your clients out in the ocean kiting, kite surfing downwind from the waves. Uh, and that was just an awful lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I joke that my first business was all about chasing the money, but ultimately there was no passion in it. 
And then I decided, all right, well, if that didn't work, I have to go follow my passion. And my second business, the kite surfing business, was all the passion. And I realized, well, there's no money in it. And, uh, and so I had to go through this, you know, decade of my life, learning both sides of that equation to realize I actually need both. And ultimately, 15.5 is, uh, is the expression of saying, okay, I'm not going to compromise profit or passion. Uh, I think the way I bring those two things together. Fine, fine and both. Yeah, it's the best. Now, now is the kite surfing business still in business or no? Is Alberto uh, still doing it? Alberto still does tours. He lives in Rio, and uh, I'll send him groups from time to time, but it's not as, it's not as ongoing an operation at the moment. So, so Robbie and I want to go sometime, right, Robbie? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, yeah, you, yeah you, you've got you've to get out there. It's, it's, uh, I, it's, I, I do. Uh, you know, I've, I've always uh, done water sports and stuff. Never kite surfed yet, but it would be a blast to learn. If you if you learn if you get the right instructor, I think it'd be a blast to learn. I, I do uh, regular surfing behind a boat, you know, wake surfing. Oh, you do? Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I do that. I, I start. You know, I, I grew up skiing, uh, you know, skiing a lot as a kid. So I did, you know, uh, slalom ski, barefoot ski, all that kind of stuff. But um, later in life, my son actually, Austin, uh, started about 13, 12, 13 years old when nobody was doing the wake surfing. This is like this is 18 years ago now. He was doing. He, he, he had a, he had like a uh, uh, not. They didn't have. They didn't really have these boards uh, all over the place. But he saw some a video or somebody doing surfing behind a, a boat. And so we had a boat with it that produced a pretty decent wave. And he started doing it behind a uh, this this boat we had. And we, you know, it wasn't a wake surf boat back then. And then uh, the wake surf boats came out, and we bought those. And I learned how to do it. And all that my you know my my daughters learned. My wife did it a little bit. Right. It's just. A, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so, I, so nowadays, I'd probably be better now at kite surfing than I would have been before when I was just a, a, a skier, right? That's um, right. Yeah. If you get but, uh, but maybe not. That's uh, that's half half the battle there. Yeah. No, that sounds like it'd be a blast. So okay. So then, how'd you get into how'd you get into your business today? Then what happened there, and what how'd that idea come about? Yeah. You know, there was an evolution uh, over my life, and especially in building that ad tech company in 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 uh, the early two thousands. Uh, I came across, I joined a group called EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, back in 2003. I was in the New York chapter for a few years, uh, moved to San Francisco, became the president of that chapter later when I, first, when I moved out. And uh, it's a great, or, great organization, I know it well. Yeah, yeah, it is a great organization. I learned a lot. I'm no longer a member, but I was there for over a decade, probably 12 years. And uh, one of the, you know, you get introduced to so many different concepts and thought leaders and ideas like, when I joined that, I had no idea about uh, you know how to structure and run a business, and I learned, uh, read the book The Rockefeller Habits from Vern Harnish, and put that all into place, and and uh, was introduced to Dan Sullivan, uh, strategic yeah. coach. Yeah, yeah. Dan's awesome. Dan's awesome. Yes, <laughs> and and, and I, I never actually did the strategic coach, but I bought the book and actually hired the uh, the author of the book Unique Ability to come in and teach our forum the concepts behind this unique ability concept. And it was the first idea that, you know, when I started to learn about this, that every person has this intersection of these, these areas, they're naturally strong, these strengths. And then you also have these areas that energize you, that you have some passion for. And when you can, when that Venn diagram comes together, that sweet spot is this place where you can, you know, essentially uh, now have the greatest opportunity for learning, growth, flow, development, potential, and your your ability to produce value in the world, um, and, and 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 something clicked there for me. I took the Strengths Finder test and the Colby test, and I started asking people about myself, and I started looking at my employees through this lens about how can I support them in finding their unique ability and unlocking their potential. And so I found a lot of joy in that process, in you know both learning how to structure the business, and then also you know this human element. Uh, then a little bit later on, I met. Met a guy named Simon Sinek, who's now had a very famous, you know, he has a famous TED Talk, great author. Uh, he's written a lot of great books. But I, I, I met him through EO two years before he did his now famous, you know, 40 million plus view TED Talk uh, at a global leadership conference event. And uh, I was almost moved to tears by his message. It was just something that really resonated with me about this concept of why and purpose. Uh, and I think that combination of the unique ability concept and the concept of, of uh, that businesses businesses really, really make an impact and resonate with their customers and, and support their employees are oriented around some really clear, strong purpose, and everything they do is communicated from that place. 
that that message really uh, uh, resonated for me. And so when I when I when it became time to start another company, um, I kind of lever. I, I looked back on those two things. I said, I'm not going to start something that isn't really authentic to to my why in the world, the, my purpose, and what I want to do, and that in, inherently is fulfilling in the process. And um, and it took me about two years to figure that out. So what I did is I moved to San Francisco. I said, I don't know anybody. I'm going to start just adding value. I'm going to meet a bunch of, I joined the EO chapter. I became the membership chair. I doubled the size of the chapter in a year. I became the president. I started just meeting with people and offering my, my help from all I'd learned. Uh, I started running these, these day-long strategy uh, retreats with a partner, uh, helping companies get clear on their why and their values and their objectives and you know, learning what worked and what didn't work in the situations with these leadership teams while I just kind of inquired as to, you know, what am I going to build? And one of the things that I, I kind of kept coming back to was in that first ad tech company, uh, I, while I, did, I wasn't really passionate about what we were delivering to our customers, I mean, we built it, it was fun, it was interesting, where I, I actually felt a sense of fulfillment was we were a scrappy little company that didn't have a lot of money after, you know, the dot-com crash. And so we couldn't pay high salaries. We'd have to, we would, we would hire people who other companies maybe overlooked. They had a gap in their resume. They didn't have the right visa and needed sponsorship. Uh, you know, they didn't go to the best school, but I could spot potential. And I would hire these people and I, I'd develop, derive a lot of fulfillment in helping them take, you know, learn and grow and develop and then be able to go to get a job paying twice as much as I could pay them. And, uh, and, and so that was one of the things that, I said, all right, well, how, how could I actually productize that and combine that with what I was learning with all these strategy retreats where half of my clients, like there was no lack of clarity as to what they wanted to do in the world and what the objective should be. But there was a big divergence between my clients who could go out and actually make it happen and the ones who couldn't. And I realized it, came, it really came down to uh, their leadership, their culture, their people, because it's not the leadership team that's gonna do all the execution right? You, yeah. have, you have to get people aligned. You have to get people engaged. You have to support them in, in doing their best work. It is what we now say, being their best selves. And so all of that kind of came together in this idea of how could I actually build a software platform in a business that would help leaders create extraordinary companies by unlocking the potential of their people. And all of it happened, you know, I, I you know, I've, I've watched that. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that Steve Jobs commencement address where he talks about, uh, um, you know, it's three different lessons. It was from Stanford years ago. And one of them is he said, look, don't worry about um, the decisions you're making. Just follow your heart. He said, you can't connect the dots looking forward, but you're going to look back and see that all these things, and, it, and it's true for me. Yeah. I mean, had I not joined EO and found, you know, the unique ability and the, um, and the uh, uh, Simon Sinek, and I had, had I not had these challenging situations of realizing okay, building a company that doesn't feel fulfilling doesn't work, and then building a company uh, that's, you know, following my passion but doesn't make money doesn't work. And, you know, it took me a long way to kind of come to all these conclusions to eventually land in what I feel like, I mean, I could be doing this forever. Uh, I love what we're building. I love the people I'm working with, the impact we're having in the world. Uh, and, it, you know, it came through all this series of, of uh, you know, serendipitous lessons and sometimes hard lessons. So tell, tell us about your business. Tell them about the business and what, and what it does and, and you know, how does it serve your customers uh, you know, better than anybody else and, and, and all the things we know that we, we know a little bit about. Let's, let's hear you know, your description of what you do today and why, you're, why you guys are, you know, are great at what you do. Yeah, that's great. So uh, the, the purpose of 15.5, you know, what we're trying to do is to, re to really help uh, create re extraordinarily highly engaged, high-performing teams by supporting people and becoming their best selves. So we have this idea of best self-management. A lot of, we're in the performance management space. We work with CEOs and COOs and VPs and heads of people who are looking for a performance management solution. And we're actually saying, great, we can sell you a performance management solution, but you should actually think of it as a best self-management solution. Because mm -hmm. the idea is, if you actually create environments that support people in being and becoming their best selves, then engagement and performance and loyalty and all these other things are the natural byproducts. Create an extraordinary culture where people are psychologically safe, they're intrinsically motivated, they're connected to purpose. You create a culture of positivity and gratitude, and it's amazing what can happen. And so, so the question is for us, how do we solve that for companies? How do we A, get them 
connected to that vision and then provide the tools and the software and the services and education to make it all work. So we started out with a very, very simple, uh, you know, our entry to the market, which is indicative of the name 15.5, is a very, very simple manager practice that the Fender of Patagonia used to use back in the 80s and was interviewed in Inc. Magazine in, in the March 1988 issue of Inc. Magazine about. Uh, in fact, the, it, was the, it was the thing, a friend of mine turned me on to the concept, and the title of the article was, I'm sorry, Yvonne's out surfing, which was the answer he would get every time the reporter called to try to interview him. And so she finally got him and said, how are you running this company if you're always out surfing? He said, well, is that, is that it? I didn't start this company to work 50 weeks a year. Uh, you know, I'm a mountaineer. I'm a surfer. I want to be out testing the equipment and, and being out in the world. Uh, and one of the things I do is I do this thing called 515 reports where I have every employee in the company spend 15 minutes a week writing a report that takes their manager no more than five minutes to read. Uh, and it creates this, this agile communication cadence where uh, employees feel like they have a voice, managers are informed naturally, and the most important things bubble up to me wherever I am in the world. And so I looked at that and said, well, well geez, if he can build Patagonia working half the year, who wouldn't want this practice for their companies? Yes. Exactly. Right? <laughs> right? So we built that. Personally, I mean, you know, being a kite surfer and a skier, I'd love to be able to work half the year and be able to work from anywhere. So I said, well, let's, let's try to do this thing. If we can, you know, kind of provide an amazing amount of value for the leaders and also have the, the employees feel a sense of autonomy and like they have a voice, that sounds like a win-win to me. So we built this very simple pra uh, product, which is just what we now call the 15.5 check-in which happens to be a wonderful tool now for this age of remote work that a lot of people are being forced into in this moment in time, um, where it's an asynchronous check-in where employees get to say, okay, here's how I'm feeling. Uh, here's how I'm doing against my strategic objectives or what we call OKRs, objectives and key results. Uh, here are my priorities for next week relative, and here, relative to the ones I did last week. Uh, this is what's working. This is where I'm challenged. And they get a chance to do something called high fives, which is a, a pure appreciation practice where they can give high fives to anywhere, anyone in the organization. And it just takes 15 minutes of reflection to, to do that update, which we found actually has inherent value for the employee themselves because they're reflecting on, on their own week, their own progress. Uh, there's a lot of positive psychology built into it because uh, one of the things that we found is that uh, we're, we're wired with a negativity bias as human beings. We're, we're wired to look for what's wrong and where the threats are. And so we actually have to, uh, counteract that by consciously focus this is why gratitude practices are actually they, they help rewire your neurology to be more positive oriented so people who have gratitude practices will often, often share they have they have a better experience of life so inside of 15.5 we're asking people to self-reflect on how they're feeling we're asking them to start reflecting on what's going well before they share their challenges we're asking them to share gratitude or appreciation for their coworkers, and again it starts to create a very different orientation for them for them as an employee and also their experience uh, of work and with their peers. Uh, and then on top of that, then as a leader, you then get in, in a very quick amount of time, you get visibility into what's happening with each one of your direct reports, wherever they are in the world. So when you do have FaceTime and one-on-ones, which we also provide, uh, a, a, you know, we've extended the, the platform far beyond just the check-in, uh, you can, as you're reading somebody's check-in, you can say, okay, let me add these two or three things to our next one-on-one -on -one agenda. Then your employee is adding their uh, items to the one-on-one -on -one agenda. So when we actually get together on Zoom or in person, I know exactly what we're going to be talking about. We don't need to waste time getting all the updates, and we can dig in on the most critical things. So today the platform looks like we've got that 15-5 check-in. You've got dashboards for your objectives across the whole company that can cascade from company-wide down to department to individual. You've got an ability of facilitate one-on-ones. Um, you've got this high five feed, which can integrate to wherever you're doing work, like in Slack or whatnot. And then we do uh, our, our take on the performance review, which we call the best self review, is designed to be more lightweight and regular. It can happen anywhere from, you know, two to four times a year, uh, where we're, we're not just looking backward and grading people and assessing their performance, but also supporting them and identifying their strengths and how to put those into action in the future so they can continue to grow and get better. And now, today, we've also combined that with the 15.5 Best Self Academy, 
which is a, an online learning platform where we're, we've just launched the Forever Free Best Self Manager training certification that anyone can take to learn all the principles on how to up-level their manager and have your result not only be producing better work product, but creating extraordinary culture with your team and helping people actually get better and not just you know, do the best they can, can in their current state. So, so is this a, you know, so is this a consulting business? It consults to businesses, or you, you can, you can, you can, you can take it, you can buy it online, or tell me about is, is this yeah. you know, person person consultant to leader? Uh, how does it how does this engage with businesses, and and what type of businesses are you guys? What's your wheelhouse? Please, super yeah. strong. What's your niches? We're we're first and foremost a software company. So, uh, and we have a few different ways we go to market. So for Companies, say up to 100 employees, you can just go right onto the website, sign up, uh, and then you can start using it with your team, your entire company. Um, and, you know, in the midst of this the pandemic that we're, we're currently experiencing, you know, as I mentioned to you prior, we've, we've decided to just give away 15.5 to those teams of up to 50 through June 15th to, to hopefully support them in reducing some of the stress of having to go, go remote so dramatically so quickly. Um, uh, for teams, say, 100 to 1,000 employees, uh, we do a, a bit of a more consultative sale. Uh, and we tend to work with more progressively oriented companies who realize that their competitive advantage lies in, in the performance of their people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, most, most of our customers have the vast majority of their employees who we use 15.5 are doing their work through computers. So it's knowledge work. It's not necessarily like cafe workers or people on the factory floor, but it's folks who are using a computer, which is a large percentage of the workforce today. Um, and so, you know, and then, and then from say a thousand to 5,000 employee teams and companies, we also have an enterprise, uh, enterprise group that also combines services alongside the software. Cool. And, and, and do you feel like the, um, you know, the core values align with most of the companies you're serving eventually after, after this, this product is serving? Do they, do they end up, you know, re-looking at values and core values often? I mean, talk, talk about how that stuff interacts, you know, the existing core values and culture that's there. Um, you know, if, if it's not that strong, yes. uh, how, does your, how does your product strengthen that, 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 uh, those values and the culture? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I would say that, you know, one of the things that we're, we're really strong at is is culture, and, and, and uh, you know it makes sense. So, you know, if you look at uh, some of the things, the the awards that we've won, we were rated number three on Glassdoor's best companies to work for. We're on Inc.'s best workplaces list. Uh, we've been on a, a, on a couple different Fortune lists, and so we talk a lot about the importance of culture and core values and mission. Our product doesn't uh, our product doesn't specifically impact those things but we have a lot of education around it for leaders. Uh, in fact, in, our, in this concept of best self-management, which is uh, the, the philosophy that we, we talk about a lot, we've broken it down into, into three pillars to, to, to create a, what we call a best self-culture, which is a culture that really brings out the best in your people and has them be on a continue, pa continual path of learning and growth and contribution, which is counter to what happens in most organizations where if you're, if you're not tuned into this, usually what happens is companies devolve into uh, silos, drama, politics, blame. You know, you get a lot of uh, gossip, all those kinds of things. So that's, that's kind of the, the default, you know, I would say if, you, if you're not putting any attention on these things. And then we're trying to create, you know, the, the opposite end of that pendulum. And, and we say that, you know, the first and foremost, you need to create a really powerful shared context, powerful and inspiring shared context. And for most companies, that's your mission, vision, values. But we extend it to the level of psychological safety that you're creating for your people, uh, the agreements that you have, the principles you operate by, all these kinds of things, the social norms that we're, we're going to opt in on. Uh, then you need the systems to actually support people in identifying their strengths and learning and growing. That's the best self pillar. Uh, but you know, just having the shared context and the structure to help people learn and grow uh, isn't going to get you all the way there because all those people are interacting with other people. And if you have relational friction, you have organizational fr friction. Yep. So the third pillar is what we call uh, cultivate relational mastery. And uh, so we provide a lot of education on how to create high order relating skills uh, and relational mastery skills where, you know, the inevitable upset or conflict can be resolved in a really good way and leave the, leave the, uh, the relationship even stronger. Uh, things like assuming positive intent, delivering truth with kindness, 
uh, there's, a, there's a number of key things that we talk about in order how to, how to create, uh, how to give and receive challenging feedback in a way that, uh, you know, kind of leaves the relationship stronger as opposed to coming from a place of blame. And so, you know, we, we teach on a lot of those things. Um, so I would say that using the product itself, which is what we did up until just this last year, that's all we sold was the product, would have cultural benefits for our clients because it would promote more positivity and transparency. And that starts to evolve, even if you're not saying, hey, go ahead and change your values, it starts to change the relational dynamics inside the company. And it's almost like a Trojan horse inside out approach that you know, three months, six months, a year later, things are just working better. Your people are communicating better. They're more open, they're more trusting. Uh, they're sharing more positivity through high fives and things like that. Uh, and now with the education piece, we're helping companies do that also top down by being more explicit about it and setting their intentions and evolving their values if they're not strong enough. And David, I found one of the points particularly interesting where you mentioned that humanity is inherently uh, negatively biased. Yes. Uh, to a certain extent, I, I think that that's probably an accurate statement. For good reason, though. Yeah, yeah for sure. If, like flight or flight, the yes. norepinephrine exists for a reason. Uh, but I guess I'm interested to understand that the, I guess the, with a little bit more depth, the way that you guys are able to first confront that there is an issue that needs to be solved. Second, how do you change that shift uh, or how do you shift them to accept the change and then be willing to implement? But then more importantly, kind of going back to where you had with your broadcasting days back in high school, yes. how does that stay and last forever? Yeah. Uh, opposed to reverting back to where, where they originated from. Yeah, so I, I would say it, it, it happens on a number of levels. So the first is that, you know, a customer is going to come to us primarily because they want better performance from their team. They want better results. It's just as simple as that. The how we go about doing it is a little bit different than, our, than, than other companies in our space. And they don't even need to buy into the whole philosophy if they don't want to. They just want a structure for better managing their teams. Great. We, we offer that. It, it starts to have some of these, you know, it starts to work on the people because, again, we, we were partnered with a number of the leading institutions like the University of, of Michigan, positive, Center for Positive Organizations, where, you know, we're, we're tapped into some of the science coming out of Wharton. Uh, we have a, 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 a director of people science who just completed the Master's in, a posit, posit, masters in a positive, psycholo, positive Psychology from Wharton and is connected with a lot of the academics there. So our product is, is informed by all of the science that you don't even need to know how it works and why. Just by using the products, some of these things start to shift. Um, that said, if people really want to make more of a dramatic change, uh, then we're educating them on, on that tendency, right? So the human tendency is to look for what's wrong because we need to stay safe. Or, you know, the, the anecdote, or, or what do they call it? It's, uh, you know, uh, people often say that you know, our brains are wired for us to survive, not to thrive. Right. And, and that makes sense. I mean, you know, we've evolved in a time where there's a lot of danger. Uh, there's a lot less danger than there is. And so we, you know, we still have this, you know, saber-toothed tiger fight or flight response that we get. But it's, it tends to be more ego danger and emotional danger than it is physical in our current environment. Um, but when you're in that sense of lack of safety, whether it's I'm just triggered in a conversation with you or I, I feel like I have an organization where there's backstabbing and I have to cover my butt, what happens is, uh, you can't relax and you're coming from that, you know, maybe not always that fight or flight space, but you're coming from a place of self-preservation and you're making decisions that are in your best interest, not necessarily in the company's best interest. And so, you know, if, if companies really want to transform that and, real, and get the best out of their people working together toward a common purpose, they need to understand that the first thing to do is they've got to create a very, a very high level of psychological safety frankly, an un uncommon level of psychological safety. And it maps really, it's, it's so interesting, the way our, our brains are actually wired map very much to Maslow's hierarchy, which you may have studied in high school or later, that yeah. says that you know, we have these hierarchy of needs. It starts with our physiology, then our safety needs, then our needs for belonging, our needs for self-esteem. When those four needs are met, uh, we're relaxed, right? We can move into that possibility of what Maslow called self-actualization, what we call best self, uh, which is characterized by an up spiral of growth and contribution. 
Now, if my self-esteem is, is, is uh, at threat or my sense of belonging is at threat, again, I go back into that fear mode and I'm trying to, to, to um, uh, you know, preserve myself. And I, I think companies historically have thought like, okay, we just need to provide for the physiology. We're gonna create a building people can work in and there's bathrooms and exits. And we're gonna provide for safety. No one's gonna come in here and kill you. But they don't provide for belonging and esteem. And so when those needs aren't met, again, you have people walking around in that, in that state of, uh, of not feeling safe uh, psychologically. And so when you create psychological safety, a couple things you do is you create a really, really strong sense of we and a strong sense of belonging. And the second thing is the, the, the best antidote to people having issues around their own self-esteem is help them reflect on and identify what their unique ability is and what their strengths are. Uh, and then help them align that to their work. Because then what happens is they start getting this great feed, feedback loop of like, wow, I'm actually good at something and I can get better. And then their peers start to notice and they get positive feedback. And when that happens, when you've got all of those kind of fundamental Maslow needs met uh, in the workplace, and the workplace is not necessarily responsible for providing them, but is, is architecting a culture that can help to create the right systems and, and trainings for manager to make sure those things get met, then and what you have is people who come together who are just like so enthusiastic about the company and the culture that they're going to do the best work of their lives. And if you overlay that with kind of the science of intrinsic motivation, which says you need uh, purpose, which is, you know, back to the Simon Sinek stuff, you need to have a clear purpose that everyone's aligned on, whether it's the company's purpose or the team's. You need to give people a sense of autonomy. You need to give them a sense of the ability to find mastery, which relates to that unique ability concept and learning and growing. And then you need to have them be connected through like relatedness, uh, which again maps to Maslow's sense of belonging. And we call it the intrinsic motivation ramp, relatedness, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, you design for that and, and all sorts of great things then happen. Then you can layer on things like accountability structures, like aligning goals and having weekly check-ins, and they're just gonna work so much better. So companies that really wanna go 100% in that direction with us, we've got a whole transformational services group that'll go in, feet on the ground, and help you actually make that cultural shift. But again, we, we don't do that with everybody, and you don't have to. You could just use the software product and get some 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 good games. Yeah, there's a ton of layers that could go into this. <laughs> yes. that, that's amazing. Um, and so then when it comes to the long run, are you guys measuring success off of an NPS score? Is it off of increased revenues, or what is the correlation there? Yeah, today, today we're measuring a uh, net promoter score for ourselves, for sure. Um, we have a lot of, uh, you know, anecdotally, uh, we get a lot of feedback from our customers who say, wow, I don't know how I ever lived without this with the software product. Um, because once you start having the structure of being in dialogue with people through those weekly check-ins, like really understand how, not only what people are doing, but how they're feeling, where they're struggling. Um, and, and, and for me as a leader, I, you know, as I mentioned, I sit here in Sedona, Arizona. Uh, my leadership team, I've got leadership team members in San Francisco, Raleigh, North Carolina, New York City, Boston, Utrecht, and the Netherlands. Uh, not only do I get updates from all of my team over the weekend, but I actually see all the high fives they're getting from their teams. And so I have this incredible window into how they're perceived as leaders, what work is happening. Uh, and I could be anywhere in the world and, and have my finger on the pulse of my whole organization, uh, which, is, which is really remarkable. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's just one, one piece there. So do you, so do you really need a three, you know, the, the concept of three sixties, right? Do you need to do three sixties or does, does this uh, really serve a purpose where they're not necessary because it does the same thing and better? I think we, we actually, we do incorporate three sixties as an option into the best self review. So uh, think about the, I, I think about the feedback loops and the, and the different kinds of feedbacks on different horizons of time. So the weekly reflection and the weekly check-in gives you the day-to-day -day assessment. Okay, things are going well or they're not. I need to have conversations. It's about what, what the work is now. We've already defined our, our objectives. We're in the 13 weeks of the quarter and we're just executing. Uh, I can tell you at six weeks into the quarter, if someone's uh, key objective goes from green to yellow, I still have six or seven weeks to work with them to get it back on track. Whereas most people set their goals in January and then they check in on April 1st and say, how did we do? When there's zero time to actually do anything about it. So sure. the weekly sure. check-in is about the reflecting on actually, are we making the right progress now? 
And then on a quarterly or twice a year basis, that's where we do a review that might include a 360 or not. So you can, you can decide I want manager feedback and peer feedback, or I just want upward feedback. So you can structure your review process throughout the year to include 360s, which is more of a, let's, let's now take a step back and be a little more reflective about the, you know, the longer term, how things are going. So I think they're, they're both useful, but um, uh, what, what we do find is that those weekly check-ins will inform when you do your, your best self-reviews because uh, you're no longer influenced by what we call the, pos the, the recency bias. Uh, most people have, um, you know, are, are a, there's a psychological term called recency bias that we tend to put a lot more weight on the things that have recently happened versus over a period of time. So if I'm reviewing someone over six months or a year, really the last four to six weeks are going to influence me more heavily, uh, and I might not be as balanced. So what's nice is you can look back through all those check-ins and all the high fives and all the goals and get more and, and, and be, have more of a balanced assessment of the person at a point in time. And then, you, and then that recency bias then becomes a benefit because you can say, oh, I can actually see you. You've been trending really well, but the last three weeks is problematic. Maybe I need to di lean in and have a conversation and see if there's something going on in your personal life. Um, that kind of thing. That sounds awesome. Based on, yeah. the, based on the pulse that you were mentioning that the leadership has the ability to recognize? Yes. Finding that there's a way that you guys could tailor that back to an HR team for a recruiter and frontline interview conversations to ensure that you're hiring individuals that are in line with the pulse of the business? That's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, we, I think longer term, and you, you asked about how do we measure these things and um, before. Longer term, we, we, I, I think we would like to be able to work on, we probably won't do anything in, in terms of the recruiting side, like the applicant tracking system, and those types of things. Yeah. But, but I do think we would like to really be able to support the entire life cycle of an employee from the criteria around hiring to helping them onboard, which we do some of that today, all the way through exit interviews. And uh, so we don't have anything with that necessarily today. Um, but again, on our, you know, in terms of the education we put out there, we certainly talk a lot about this concept of employee lifetime value, find, you know, how to recruit right fit people for your company and your culture. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a lot about that in, in, our, in our education. Uh, one of the other things on the measurement piece that I just remembered I forgot to mention is that um, we, we are also working on a way to, uh, to help, help companies assess, uh, you know, on a more broad basis, uh, where they stand in certain areas. I, won't, I, won't, I can't go into too many details right now because it's not yet released, but there are ways that we're, provide, we're gonna be providing really, really cool science back measurement that nobody else is doing. Cool. How, many, how many customers do you serve nowadays? Um, We've got about 2,300 today. Um, yeah, about 2,300 customers. There's about 200 employees now. Average size, uh, the companies you serve, are you know, will it be employees or revenues or something like that, you any idea? It's a good question. You know, there's there's a um, it's a bit bifurcated because we have both a self service approach where we have a lot of small companies and teams. You know, uh, a lot of twenty to eighty person companies in that in that camp. And then we also have companies that are you know well over a thousand employees. Uh, I think our biggest customer yeah, biggest customer probably has four thousand people using fifteen five today. So still not big big enterprise. Um, but I would say our sweet spot today is probably in that. 100 to 500 employee range. Uh, is, it's probably the bulk of the bell curve. Does, does your product change a little bit when you go from a 20 person company to 100 to 1,000 people? I mean, does the product, uh, the, the structure of it change at all? Well, what's kind of nice about it is um, we started out building 15.5 really for small companies and small teams. And so that was really what we sold was that, that check in. Turns out that check in doesn't really change whether you have 10 people or 10,000 people because it's still just the manager employee interacting yeah. together. Now what goes around that, however, really needs to change is you move, what we say, move, you know, moving up market, uh, because you now need to be able to support different needs of the people team or the HR team, the CEOs, uh, account management and user management becomes a big thing, integrating with other uh, HRIS systems, providing great reporting. So that's a lot of the stuff that we've built over the last uh, year, year and a half is supporting these larger teams. How uh, transparent is the information? In other words, if you, you know, if, if you have a one of your leaders that, that has a person reporting to them, um, you know, 
are you are you able to look at the information or is it totally between them private to, to that that conversation yeah so by default what happens is if i have um i can drill down on any of my direct reports so as the ceo of 15.5 i can see everybody and i can drill down to anyone now any individual if they want to make a private comment to their manager they just flag the item as private so there, there are private conversations that are happening that i'm not privy to uh, my team will sometimes give me private conversations and uh, private comments. And if, and if you want to, you can just make it all open. Some companies like us actually choose to make all of our 15.5s open to anybody. Uh, so every, you know, anyone can read my 15.5, for example. And uh, if there's anything I want private between my managers, I can, I can, I can reply privately. Does anybody say, hey, if it's negative, man, you know, just privately, right? If it's, if it's positive, openly, or they say, you guys say, you know, most things negative, positive, we want, we're okay with transparency. Yeah, we're, we're okay with transparency for the most part, unless there's a, uh, you know, I would say if there's an interpersonal issue um, that someone's trying to work out and they're looking for feedback, they might keep that private. Um, sure. But, but uh, you know, it's, it's also cultural. You know, uh, we have someone on our leadership team who was speaking to recently and said, yeah, you're my last job. It wasn't okay to share bad news. Or, or, or what was wrong. And, and again, that, why? Because they didn't have psychological safety. Turns out if you have a culture where it's not okay to share bad news, you know, it's not a good, uh, it, it, things aren't gonna end well uh, if people can't be honest or if they feel like they're gonna be, um, you know, penalized for being the bearer of bad news. And so we, have a, we, have a, we definitely have a culture where we promote um, transparency and honesty it's uh, you know it's 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 certain it's it's very acceptable to express like I don't know or I'm challenged by this sure because how else are you gonna get better absolutely I love it uh, okay so now you're you know you're a big networking guy hey, you, know, I, I, you know what you know EO I'm in YPO and you're you know EO is much like that where you know you're you're, you're there to build a network of great you know great minds that you can that you can help and, and be helped with right um, yep are you able to ever network your, you know, these customers together if needed, right? And is there, is there a point where you can say, man, we got a network, uh, you know, of, of uh, 15 fibers, man, you can be part of if you want to. And, and here's what, here's what, here's where their expertise, here's where their expertise lie and, and yes. so on. Is there, is there an option on that in the future or what? Well, it, it's very funny you should say that because I, I, the reason I was actually late joining you today was because I was on that very, very uh, call with my team. <laughs> so right. we are, actually, we're actually in the process of, uh, of thinking of ways that we can create, um, we can bring our customers together with us to, to not just be the ones fully guiding where this is all going, but we wanna create an opportunity to really co-create the future of work with our customers. And yeah. there are some people that were, were exploring ways to do that, and, you know, being able to connect customers together, being able to give them access to exclusive, uh, um, you know, ex exclusive thought leaders like Amy Edmondson, who was going to speak at our Best Self Conference, who wrote the book on psychological safety, and Simon Sinek, who's uh, one of our advisors and investors uh, on some of his work. And so we're, we're really thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we leverage even some of that EO, YPO uh, learning model and forum model for our customers and do some great things there. So it's in the brainstorming uh, stage right now, but, but I'd like to see things move in that direction. We're putting some, some attention on it. It sounds like you're going to have a lot of really cool, you know, um, relationship leverage to, so that you can, you can add value to everybody. And, you know, when, when people look at your product or any product in the future, it's always nice to under, understand, hey man, this is what it delivers. It's a great product. But besides this, look at else, what else we get out of this. We met these five different companies that we do business today. We wouldn't have otherwise. Exactly. Right? So, I mean, it could be awesome. I, I'm, I'm involved in a bunch of different national, uh, national associations and foundations. And what the fun I have is, is, is bringing these people together outside that, that, uh, the mission that's there as it let's do business together too. Yeah. And, and create, create real value so that, so that when we look at the, 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 the fee next year, the annual fee next year, whatever it is, 10 grand or 50 grand or this, and, and show more value than just the, the mission at hand here, if we can help <laughs> each other do business. Otherwise, right? That's right. So that's uh, that's that. really cool. I can see that awesome, awesome uh, um, add-on to your business for sure. Um, when when you when you look at uh, you know you look at the long haul of this business, what, what you know, ten years from now, five years from now, do you have any any goals of how many customers you want to be serving at that point, or is there any any type of metrics that you're looking to achieve? Yeah, I would say long term, uh, we would like to be working with at least uh, at least a million employees. Um, 
uh, well, no, actually 10 million employees, sorry. Uh, yep, so, so 10 million employees across the world, global. Uh, wow. uh, you know, I mean, that, it, it's certainly possible given, given the scalable nature of SaaS and given our growth rate. Uh, All right. Definitely within the realm of possibility. But I think more importantly, you know, that doesn't drive me as much. I mean, that's just a, it's just one marker of success and one marker of impact. Uh, the big thing I want to accomplish is actually to change the predominant paradigm of work from one where companies believe to succeed, they have to do so at the expense of their people, to one where they realize that to, to really succeed, uh, it's by supporting their employees and succeeding and thriving. And that's the yeah. way they're going to that's the way they're going to succeed. And I, it's still, we still have a lot of holdover from this industrial revolution uh, mentality where, you know, we should be managing our people that we're at odds with our employees. It's us versus them. Um, and, and that made sense in an environment where companies needed hardworking, cheap labor who could follow a script, sure. uh, right? Which is what you needed in that era. And that's not yeah. what people want for themselves, right? Uh, so, you know, and, and you want to do it at the lowest cost. So, you know, you needed labor unions and all these kinds of things. And, and even though we're not managing our teams necessarily the same way today, there's still kind of that idea in the background. And it turns out that the best companies in the world today are the ones who are innovating. And the, the way they're innovating is they have, they have highly competent people who are passionate and creative, right? They're using the best of their, of their, of their minds and their ethos to go out and create these new ideas and collaborate and do it in service of uh, the higher purpose. And it turns out that's what companies need and want from their people. And that's actually what people want for themselves, but nobody's actually woken up to realize we can actually manage that way, at least not in mass. So that's the shift that I'm really wanting to uh, see in the world. I, I think it's an awesome shift and it's necessary. I, I love it. I mean, if, if we, if we as leaders can't, can't, uh, love each person that comes to work in our, in our teams, right? We're, we're, you know, uh, wearing our names on, on gear that, that, that we might be handing out and, and uh, representing us in our best interests every day. More, you know, yep. more time spent in our, in our businesses, right, that we lead than they do with their own family, right? Because right. we can't treat them right. as family and, and love, love them as family. Boy, you know what? We're going to be missing out because the, the best businesses of the future will. Right. Yes, exactly. And you're 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 basically uh, you're you're teaching uh, businesses how to communicate on a, on a more often basis, a needed basis. Because as old school leaders, you know, I'm kind of in the middle, right? I, I I'm kind of an older school leader. You know, my people that I worked around as a young guy, a young person, right? That it was you know just you get a paycheck, shut up and do your job, right? And that, right. that's kind yeah. of mentality. And and if if you if you you challenge, you know, who are you to challenge, right? Right. <laughs> In today's world, that doesn't work, and it should never work because those, those businesses that, I, that, that you know, my the bosses that I worked around or people I knew, they weren't growing. They weren't going anywhere, right? They were they were one one person, uh, you know, band with a couple part time employees or, or maybe a few employees, and they were never going to grow outside that because they weren't giving their their team teammates uh, the ability to to think outside the box, to learn, to make to make mistakes and fail and fail fast and learn and and think freely, right? Exactly. And so what you're doing, you're, you're giving businesses the, the, the ability uh, to really, um, I, I think, uh, you know, harness the, the, the intelligence that they have that they might not know they even have, right? Exactly. So that's really, that's really cool. Actually, funny that, that there's a lot of similarities in the last, the last podcast we did. Um, and uh, it, it was a lot about um, everybody ha has, just like you mentioned earlier, a, a certain amount of expertise, right? They're subject matter experts at something. If they spend 10,000 hours or more at something, they're experts at that right, right? Yep. and it might be it might not be in the business that we that they work with any even right but if but if they if they if everybody knows what they're experts at even if it's outside business they they become more respected with people around them whether people around them are into whatever that is or not and and they and they become the knowledge source for that that subject even if it's a vac you know, a vacation or something or yes travel, whatever it is right but but in, in our businesses if we can harness the expertise of every person on our team uh, and then even our, our friends outside, and I think that's what you do as a great networker. Is you, know, you, you you look for expertise of, of, of any type, and, and to be able to harness 
you know, uh, relationships in the future, to be able to connect people together and say, hey, yes. I know a person, I know, I know a guy, I know a girl, right? It's so much fun when you can put people together right. that, that make each other so much stronger, right? So which, but what you're, you're doing is you're doing that in the workplace that's not, and it's not common. So, so I love right. it. It's, it's, well, you know what, what's interesting yeah. about that, you know, when you put people together, it's usually because you have an idea of like, oh, that's, that, that person is the X guy or that woman is the Y girl. You know, like you're, you've, you've, you've related them to some area of expertise because you've actually connected with them in an interpersonal way and you've learned about them. But yes. we go to work doing our job and we never learn about each other, right? Yeah, yeah. So imagine if you're in the workplace where everybody's clear on what their zone of genius is or their unique ability or whatever language it is and yeah. everybody else knows and they're known for that. Uh, and then you create more opportunities for people to share it. So one of the cool things we do, uh, we actually have three all hands meetings every week, which is a lot. And we do that every morning, uh, every Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific for 30 minutes. And the first two are mandatory. So on Mondays, we come in and again, in kind of in light of this, you know, uh, positive psychology, we do a gratitude meditation for two minutes and we have the whole company reflect on something you know, whatever it is. Uh, it could be running water, red blood cells, or, uh, you know, uh, family members or something like that. And then we'll the numbers and all that kind of stuff. Wednesdays, we have somebody who every month they're chosen to lead, guide the whole company through a, a, a five-minute guided meditation. They do that for four, four Wednesdays in a row. And then we talk about, we have a different department give updates on to, to make sure everybody's aligned. But, the, you know, the gratitude meditation on Monday, the guided meditation on Wednesday, is an opportunity for everyone to have, you know, kind of some shared humanity uh, that that just sets a different personal tone. And we're all on Zoom, you know, 200 people. But Fridays, where it, it, it's more, it's optional. But I'd say we still have 60% of people coming in, and, it, and it's called Question Friday. And so, because even though we have 60% of people in offices typically, um, we have a lot of people who are remote. We all, all still show up on Zoom, and there's somebody who asks a personal question. And it could be anything like, you know, what was a dream you had as a kid that you had to, that, that you had to let die? Or, you know, what, what, did, what did you want to be when you grow up? Is this just a simple one, right? Someone will pose the question uh, to the entire group. Uh, they get to ask uh, questions for a month and then they pass it on. And then you end up getting randomly broken out into a group of 10 year peers uh, from across the company. And everyone goes around, just shares a personal answer to that and we get to know each other as human beings that we would never do otherwise uh, it takes about 15 or 20 minutes and it creates this incredible amount of shared humanity cross-functional uh, relationship trust uh, and, and and we find that you know if we didn't do that there are just so many things like I wouldn't have even known about my co-founders <laughs> had we not had this practice and I know about some of their things that they're really passionate about outside the office or different skills so I think you got to, you know, if you want to do that, we do that in our personal lives, but we don't do it. We don't, we don't create that space in, inside of work. Sure. Um, I think it's a real opportunity missed for a lot of companies. I, I love it. Yeah. You know, we, we, because of my experience in forums uh, like yours, right. We, we've, we've used them in our businesses and uh, for some time we're, we're consistent. Then we got off it. Everybody got busy, but then we got back into, we, you need to, we need to be consistent with it because it'll, the relationships that have grown because of, forums uh, that, that we've had within our businesses has been incredible. Yes. Right. Leaders from across our you know, eight or nine companies that now, you know, that know each other, trust each other and, and are, are, you know, love calling on each other for, for their, you know, shared, shared experiences, right. Compared to before not knowing each other, not feeling comfortable, not loving each other. They, they didn't, you know, didn't, didn't feel comfortable and didn't care, didn't care, care to talk to that person that ran the business uh, across the, across the office from, right. So, I, I think it's in, it's imperative that we do more of it for sure. Yeah. And everybody gets caught, caught in their their day to day, and boy, I don't have time for this. Well, it's important you make time for it because you're you're going to get a heck of a lot more out of it. You're going to be way more productive than, than otherwise. Exactly. So yeah. it's really it's really cool. Uh, what what's uh what, when are you going to get into YPO, dude? You're, you're, uh, you're I gonna, know. You got, you got to be pushing what thirty eight or 40 no no I'll be I'll be forty four in uh, just a few days here a month. Dude, or two. you better move then. You only got a year left. I know. I heard I got a year. Yes, I, I actually have a friend, another wife. I have a number of YPO friends actually, uh, who has said you know has been telling me I got to do it. Well, you got uh, another one now too. I'm telling you too. I'm your new. All right, all right. right. I'm telling you right now. It's a, just like EO, right? It's really a game changer. And uh, exposes you so many, so many opportunities. Your fa your family. You any, you any kids? I do. I got a little six year old. Uh, All right. Yeah. So. Uh, or a girl. 
a little boy. We ski a lot together uh, up in Flagstaff. Uh, at, you know, I live in Sedona, so we go up to Flagstaff about an hour away and ski a bunch on the weekends. And Are you married? In the mountain biking series. What's that? Not married, no. No. So, again, you know, with YPO, you're just like you, right? You're, you're so many cool things for your son that you do with your son, father-son things and stuff for him to learn as he gets to be a teenager. Put it, You can send him leadership camps or amazing leadership camps. So I'm, I'm quite a cheerleader for YPO. It's done a lot for, for my life to, to put me in, uh, in, in front of uh, friends and, and trusted advisors I never would have had, right? Just like, yeah. just like you. So it's a, it's a really cool, uh, if, you, if you need another sponsor, you let me know, buddy. I love this. All right. You, you know, amazing. Great. Appreciate that. Amazing. Um, so, so uh, if, if, you, if you look at this, this uh, passion in this business, I mean, what's, what's the goal for the business itself? Are you, are, are you looking to you know, uh, are, are you looking for this to be an acquisition someday or, or you know, what's your, what's your ultimate goal? Yeah, I, our goal is to, is to, is to continue to build this and, and, and have 15.5 be a, uh, a long-term enduring sustainable independent company. Uh, you know, and, and it depends, you know, there's a lot of things that have to go right for that to happen. Uh, but again, it comes back to, you know, we've had opportunities to sell the company in, in the past and I've turned them down. They would have been, you know, life change. It would have changed my life in a lot of different ways. Uh, but it wouldn't have felt right to have not gone for, as I said, you know, the numbers are great, but I really want to have create this paradigm shift to have this become the default way that companies uh, operate. And we've got a long way to go on that. So, so do, you, do you look at this, uh, uh, David, do you look at this as a competitor to like uh, EOS and the traction system? Or do you look at it as like a, something that could be partnered with that? Or what, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it's, it's complimentary. In fact, actually, I don't know if you know Cameron Harold, um, uh, who's, uh, uh, he's, I think he's been involved in the YPO world before. Uh, uh, I just got connected with Gina Wickman from, from Traction uh, this week. Gina. Yeah, uh, Gina's you know, sold the EOS, but but it's very it's very uh, um, it's very complimentary. So if you're doing EOS, you believe in rocks, you believe in communication rhythms. Fifteen five is a way to operationalize through software rocks and communication rhythms. Yep. So uh, the lines, if you're a Rockefeller Habits proponent or you're an EOS proponent, fifteen uh, five is a great plugin for that. So we use it. We use we've been using EOS for about two and a half years, I guess, and it's a great yeah. it's, it's a it's a great system. We like it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's system, we do. It's very awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. If it bolts on to that, that 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 means I mean that's uh, that's that's something that's a no brainer for you to really bolt you know to, to get into, uh, to be to be close to them because there's got to be a lot of opportunities to really align with them. What yes. what's the, what's the cost per 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 teammate? Let's say um, in a two hundred person company, what's the cost on an annual basis to to, to use your system? Yeah, so the uh, list price on the website uh, for the basic, which includes the check ins, the one on ones, the high fives, uh, that's uh, about seven dollars per employee per month. Goes up to about fourteen dollars. Goes up to fourteen dollars per employee per month when you when you go into uh, what we call plus which includes the reviews, it includes the OKRs or rocks, and if, if that's your language, um, and, uh, and, and more analytics and reporting and, and, and different things along those lines. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say that... Uh, so, 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 so 170 bucks a year for all in, per, yeah, per employee? Per person, yep, exactly. For, the, for, the, for, the, for the everything, everything included, that's really... That's, everything that's, included, that's, yeah. Sounds like an amazing value, man. Sounds like you're too doggone cheap. Baby. You know, <laughs> right. Sounds like you got opportunity for more, a little higher EBITDA, man. We do, we do, but when we're doing, we're doing quite well. You know, I mean, the, the nice thing about software is you have, you know, 85, 90% gross margins, and uh, <laughs> when, you, when you do it at scale, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it works. So, uh, Ro Robbie, you and our team, we need to look at this, dude. It's, it sounds like something that's right up our alley. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was thinking. I have it done as a note to look into. Oh, it. Right. Sure. Well, I'm happy to help any way I can, for sure. So, Robbie uh, uh, works with, uh, with Austin, our, new, our CEO. Austin took my spot here recently, but I think Robbie's going to be all over Austin to jump on that and between him and Austin, look into it because it seems like That's Austin. Great. That's and great. and uh, if it works for us, you know, it'll, we're, we're, we're pretty – we, we actually have like uh, eight or nine companies, small to medium-sized companies, um, you know, maybe 450 people all together, something like that with all the companies. And uh, – so we're a little complicated, and we and we all we all live off the same core values. We oh. uh, we have the same why, right? Um, innovating yep. to innovating to serve is our goal. To 
be the most innovative in everything we do to serve our customers and our, our stockholders better than anybody else. So for us, uh, you know, we're, it's, it's all right up your alley. And, 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 and like I said, we have a complication of different companies, but this doesn't even, this doesn't complicate that at all. Even if we have, you know, the, the 10 person company or the 200 person company, it works for all of them. So that's really, right. that's cool. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. And we, 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 all, we have a hard time also, uh, David, we, I talk about, man, I want to do 360s. We've done them in the past, right? But it's like uh, you don't ever seem to, you know, get on a schedule to do them consistently. Yes. Kind of a little bit of pain, a little bit of pain to do it, right? Um, but this is something that once you're in, you're in, and, you, and you're doing it consistently. And I, I love the rhythm of it. You know? That's right. So, yeah. That's my, awesome. My whole belief is that, you know, I, I, I like to design my life so I can just put the structures in place and set it and forget it. And yeah. uh, a lot of that has informed. And I will say, you know, Rockefeller Habits and EOS informed my mindset around those things. And they definitely yeah. informed even the creation of this product. So, for sure. Yeah. For sure. All right. So, uh, what kind of deal are you get? You, know, you talk talk offline the deal you're going to get, Rob. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're seriously very interesting because I think it, well, it's great. Uh, it does all the things we're talking about that we need to do better. So, uh, yeah. I appreciate it. Um, so, 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 um, what else, Robbie? What other questions you got for this all star? Yeah. The thing that I was wrestling around with was I felt like we kind of brushed over the younger years of your life. I'm curious uh -huh, just yes. to understand a little bit more, uh, in w the way in which you grew up and some of the mentorship you had there and how that ended up transcending into your adult years. Yeah. Um, we can definitely go back. Uh, I was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I grew up in, um, uh, in a little cutting out there. You guys can hear me okay? I got you, yeah. Hey, Perfect. also, yeah, if you, could, uh, if you could round this out with a little bit of that and then a couple of mentors that really you think about really made a difference in your life. You know, be, be, your parents we know, right? But beyond yeah. that, a couple of mentors that you, you, you said, man, I want to be like that gal or that guy, right? Uh, if you can explain this, that to us and round this out, that'd be awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a great that's a great uh, question. Yeah, in terms of the in terms of the mentorship, you know, the first thing comes to mind is actually a couple of people who had pivotal conversations with me, um, who you know they were they were mentors in a in a short period of time, but maybe not over a long period of time. Uh, one was my uncle Kenny, and he was uh, uh, my godfather. And uh, when I was working for that consulting company, and I had this idea for this startup. Uh, he took me out to dinner in New York City. He, he was a um, uh, publisher, entrepreneur, published uh, some publications in the, in the pharmaceutical world. And I distinctly remember him sitting me down and, and I, I was explaining, like, you know, I've got this great salary and we're, I, we're not going to make any money doing this thing. I don't know how I'm going to survive. And he said, look, you have two, two, there are two moments in your life when it's never going to be easier. He said, right in this moment, when you have zero responsibilities and you're right out of school, or you can go off, get married, have a family. And when your kids go off to college, you could, you could do it again. And have, those are two points of, of minimum risk. Yeah. And, and just the idea of like, okay, well, if I don't do it now, it could be never. Uh, gave me the confidence to take the leap. I didn't know how I was even going to make my next paycheck. And we just figured it out, right? And uh, it was that, that conversation was really huge for me. Uh, you know, to give me the, you know, just put things into context. And, and I find, I think that... Um, I think great mentors, uh, whether they're in your life for a long period or for a moment like this, uh, are, are people who can help recontextualize your thinking or have you think in a different way. Uh, another one actually was, was a gentleman who was one of my first customers at Kite Adventures down in Brazil who ended up, uh, he, was, he he'd run a number of companies, sold worked for IBM, sold companies to IBM, uh, the CEO of a, of, of a, of a public company. And, um, uh, I, I went out to visit him uh, when I was conflicted about leaving the ad tech company and move it and, and, and whatnot. And I, I had lunch with him out in, 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 in Sausalito, California. And I was explaining to him, I said, look, I, I, he was asking me questions. He said, you know, what do you think is the potential of this thing? And, you know, asking me how engaged I was with it. I said, well, you know, I, I don't think it's got great potential, but I really want to, you know, just stick with it maybe another three years and see what happens. And he just, cut right through the BS and called me out on that and said, look, the opportunity cost of spending another three years on this thing, even if you don't know what's next, is yeah. enormous. And, and, and that had me go back to New York and have a tough conversation with my partner and leave. 
And it was the best thing I could have ever done in my entire life because the timing was what I didn't share was, you know, again, one of these other, you can't connect the dots looking forward moments. I move out to the Bay Area. I don't know a single soul. I join the EO chapter, start meeting all those folks and recruiting for that. So I'm meeting a lot of entrepreneurs. But because I was also doing this kite surfing thing, I got invited to the second annual event of this thing called the Mai Tai Kite Camp out on Maui, which was a group of entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, invite only, who would congregate on Maui. Uh, Bill Tai was the VC. He's one of the early you know, angel investor in Zoom and a bunch of other great companies. And, uh, and Susie Mai was this pro kite boarder. So Bill Tai, Susie Mai got together and called this thing the Mai Tai Kite Camp. And they brought all these pro kite boarders together and all these hotshot entrepreneurs and VCs together. And I found myself in the midst of this community, not really having any network in tech. Next thing you know, uh, I have all these incredible relationships in tech and, and certainly helped me as I started to build 15.5 and go out and raise venture capital. Uh, and, and, and again, I would not have moved out to the Bay Area at that time and left my first company had I not had this one conversation where, you know, again, from his perspective, he saw, look, you know, you might want to think about this differently. And then a whole series of events transpired like to where I am today. So, you know, that's those are cool. a couple of like, really, I mean, it's, I think that's, it's just, I think it's important to go and have conversations with people who have, you know, been further along the path that you have, who have different perspective and be open, right? Not be so sure about your own thinking and decisions and be open to considering different perspectives. And then I think, you know, growing up, I was always, I always, I, I you know, kind of idolized Steve Jobs as a, as a, as, as a visionary leader. Uh, certainly some of the things that have come out about his, you know, the way he treated people, maybe not so, uh, you know, didn't, he really wasn't really clear about that and not idolizing those aspects, but the, but, you know, who knows, uh, but his ability to basically go out and like, not, uh, what is it? I mean, just believe that a different reality was possible and not take no for an answer, essentially, right? Well, yeah, and, and and as you know, you don't have to, you, you can take the best of the mentor, not That's the right. worst. That's so, right. What a great yeah. mentor you are. There's so many things you can learn. And you can take the worst and be mentored by that as well. So you know, you're, right. you're, you're going you're gonna to be the, the Steve Jobs uh, uh, plus, you know, when you, when you right. look at uh, the cultural builder you are. So no, yeah. it's awesome. And the fact reality more, distort, you know, they talk about the reality distortion field and, uh, you know, essentially, you know, like so fervently believing in this vision that you're just willing it into reality. Um, I, I think that I, I hold it. I hold a lot. I've, I've learned a lot from that, and I hold a level of that that I am not willing for humanity not to move in the direction that I'm going to move it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, and we, and we have a we have a bunch of bunch of my bunch of my friends that have been on our, our podcast. Same thing. They they had many non-believers. You know, yeah. almost everybody non-believers in their in their idea. And they continue to push forward, right? And sometimes you, you really fall on your face hard eventually realize that they were all right, right? <laughs> right, yes. But as an entrepreneur, right, you, 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 if, you, if you really have a vision and you know you're going to serve the masses well, yes. um, boy, you got to keep pushing on if you can, man, because great things happen, like, like your story, like Steve Jobs and, and many of these others. So, I mean, right. if, if, if you want to be a, you know, you, 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 know, you want to be like everybody else, that's great. You want to be safe. And listen to listen to everybody else. That and you know, that, as you said before, most people start out with a neg, a neg, more of a negative mindset. Um, so even your best friends that care about you, love you, start out with, "Hey, man, you really, really, David, are you, you sure about that? Sounds a little crazy, man. Sounds, right. little, sounds like you're getting crazy again, right? Yeah. But, uh, but but in the long run, you you know that if if, if uh, you've done more work and, and due diligence to understand something, you're asking people that haven't, and and you know. You, you you've got the you know you've got the vision that's going to come through so it's awesome that's right. i can't wait can't wait to see this thing grow to 10 million dude 10, yes, 10 million. thank you and uh, and and robbie and i are going to help you right robbie? all right absolutely yeah i'd love to help that's great sounds like a lot of fun i'm gonna look into, we, we look into ypo now that i uh you know you're the third person in a month who has yeah, mentioned yeah. it but i gotta take i gotta take that as a sign yeah. you gotta do it Hey, also, also, just uh, I'm, you know, this is be on our podcast, David. We're, we're uh, one of our companies. My son moved up to be the CEO of our organization. Took my spot. I moved to a chairman role. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, we've got one of our companies that he he exited. Well, he's still overseeing it as leader of the group of companies. But it's a it's an awesome technology. It's a it's a uh, real estate technology company. So a prop tech uh, company, oh, yeah. basically. 
and yeah. uh, and Robbie's done a lot of work in this company too. But it's a really cool company. We're looking for a CEO for that's got, had some experience um, kind of in the world. It's, it, we use drones and satellite imagery, and then we have subject matter experts on the back end that assess uh, you know pavements that we're really good at and roofing that we're good at and all, huh. all different stuff. The facilities around a building, right? We 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 basically assess. 100% of facilities using super fast technology to get all the information we need, saving wow. our customers a ton of money. Huh. The business is, uh, business is already in front of the biggest uh, real estate owners in the, in the, in the country, the world, really. I mean, Walmart's a big user of it. Um, nationally, um, Prologis, um, Home Depot, we've got a great, bunch of great partners that are, that are using this product right now. And, and, and we, it's a you know, small business that, that's going to grow you know, really fast in the near future. And now we need to we need a, a CEO to take Austin's spot that can that can raise capital that can that can uh, understand how to build the, these systems to continue to grow this thing. We're we're we're, we're building AI into this, so it's going to be AI um, driven as much as our engineers and, and experts. So it's a really cool product. And, and so if you out there in your in the world of Silicon Valley, if you know anybody kind of looking for the next thing, um, it, it's a, it's going to be an awesome opportunity for whoever we, you know whoever we choose for this. Huh. I actually know a, uh, I just, just spent a brief amount of time with a, a real estate, uh, a prominent real estate developer up in Vancouver, whose son is also building a, a different uh, prop tech company, and they're also looking to uh, uh, raise money in Silicon Valley, uh, so it huh. might just be good to get you guys connected. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Rob, Robbie and Austin know more about the product, and Olivia, one of our partners, know more about it than, uh, than I do. I mean, I know the value of it, but they, they know yeah. the, the everyday about it and we've also got a within that business we can see water under the ground eight to 20 feet now we have a, a, a bolt-on uh, pro, uh, product that we we partnered with an Israeli company who huh. discovered they discovered water on Mars and Venus and they, wow. they took that for, for NASA uses their technology every day right and, and and they took that to a business uh, discovering uh, water leaks in pipe all, all over the world and big municipalities all over the world they're in 24 or five countries now Anyway, that company we partnered with, and, and together we've discovered how to figure out groundwater as well. So for us, groundwater, you know, really, really kills the life of pavements and roofs also, you know, water and insulation in roofs. So uh, bottom line, we add that to the, this, this product, this company called Site, and it's an amazing uh, differentiating product that nobody else in the world has. And that, now we just got to continue on with some good leadership and, and raise the right capital. So again, if you know anybody at and this is what this is about, man. This, this, this podcast okay. is all about you know, how, how do we network to get stronger? How do we grow yes. stronger? And you, you know, guys like you and I, Robbie, and, and people listening, um, you know, we, we become way stronger as we network and become friends with others that, that, that yep. are, are actually in, in different right. places that we're weak at, right? So any, anywhere, anywhere I can help you in the future, any of my business can help you in the future, I'm there for you, bud. And uh, I'd I love, love to meet you in person. So yeah, like I come, out, come out your way, you come our way. We do a business in Phoenix. We're in California sometimes, uh, but you know Chicago is our is our is our hub pretty much. But yeah. if uh, if we can ever uh, meet up, I'd love to love to share more experience with you and get to know you better. That'd, that'd be great. Check out also the uh, company called Drone Deploy if you're familiar with them. We um, know them well. We know you them do. Well. Okay, I'm friends with the CEOs in a in a, a EO like group, 10x CEO group with the CEO of uh, Drone sure, Deploy. Sure, sure. Yeah, contact there. That's helpful. They've got a nice company. This company is a competitor of theirs. In, in, uh, oh, it is. Okay. I wasn't sure if you guys would collaborate. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> so Austin knows uh, knows them well and knows the company well, and, and uh, I know of them, right? But yes. so they, I'm, I'm guessing they've heard of they've heard of our company called it's called Site S I T E. But, okay. Uh, very, Drone Deploy is a very respectable company that we, we, we like yeah. them as competitors. So. That's great. Good, good. All right, man. Wait. Well, thanks for everything, Robbie. You're gonna get some take. You're gonna lay out lay out the takeaways. Uh, you got you want to throw out there right now? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so going back to the beginning of our conversation, one of my, the main takeaways I took away from your upbringing was listen to your inner voice. Mm. And for you, that meant that it was going against the grain for you to become an entrepreneur and. You mentioned it as a rebellious stage of your life, but I think it's important for you to truly chase after your passions. And I think that ties into the second point, which is you need to optimize for your passion plus profit was the outcome yes. that you realized. Uh, and that ends up becoming a catalyst for you to unlock your own potential. And from there, I think the last two points that I have really tie in together too, which is that your people at your organization are truly your competitive advantage. And 
I know that that's been said for years and the execution has maybe been missed, but it's important for us to constantly keep an eye out for the individuals who have talent or interests that are currently not being leveraged and, and work to maximize that and the organization will be better as a result. Well, I'll, hey, Robbie, awesome stuff there. And I'll finish with, uh, you know, the, the uh, profits uh, and, the, and the passion. What, what, I, what I think, uh, you know, David is finding out is we all will, right? I mean, we can do what we're passionate about and say, man, that's, this is our thing. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with it. And maybe, maybe just make a, a living to get by and feed our family, right? And that's great. But how cool is it when you can really discover a passion that's scalable, like, like right. David, David's products, right? They're scalable to serve, serve people all over the world, right, at a massive scale. That's really cool. I mean, when, when you, can, you can take your, your, your passion and you can make a profit from it and, and you serve the world like nobody else before you, that's, that's awesome, right? I mean, that, that's the best when you can do that. And that's what David's doing. So God bless you, buddy. It's awesome to watch what you're doing. And, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see where you're, you know, see where you're, I'm excited to see where you've gone, but really excited to see where you're going. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Robbie, that was a great recap. It's been a great chat with you guys. Yeah, same to you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, and uh, we'll see you next time on Dish Digger CEO. See ya!